all for that introduction. Let me share my screen. And um, as Paul said, I'm based in Mexico City. And one of the things you probably noticed uh, from that introduction is that my uh, I have a special interest in games, game-based learning and gamification. It's something that um, I started getting interested in when it first emerged as being um, an, an option for educators. And it's interesting because I think it sort of, the enthusiasm died down for a while and it's picked up again and I've become interested. And I started looking at some of the things that I, I looked at about 10 years ago now um, when it first appeared. And I was pleased to see that a lot of the initiatives that were started then are still around and still very popular. So I think it is true to say that gamification is um, now probably a tried and tested uh, strategy. And hopefully I can uh, share with you why I think that and some practical ideas for you all to use in the classroom for you to try out. So the question really is, gamification, is it, can it be effectively used in language teaching and how? And can games or game elements help motivate learners and provide a stimulating environment for language practice? So I'll be looking at that and I'll also be looking at the meaning of fun, play and games and explore how um, you can use these elements uh, with your class classes. So let's move on. Does anybody recognize what this is? Um, I used to have one of these. I don't have one anymore, but um, it used to be something I used quite a lot. It is an example of how gamification is now embodied in our day-to-day -day lives. And although you may not know about this, unless you take an interest in uh, something uh, that requires it. So there's now, I think, a whole secret layer of gamification going on all around us at work and at play. Um, one example is Pokemon. Uh, Pokemon Go, um, there are people who are wandering around your towns and cities looking to capture monsters. I'm not going to talk about that, but I am going to talk about some of the other general aspects of gamification before we move on to the language classroom. So this is an example of gamification in daily life. What is it? Do you know? Well, yes, I'm sure some of you uh, do know. It's a device that measures the amount of paces that you do, which allows you to measure your work, walking or running progress. So the idea is that it motivates you to run or to walk or to do exercise by keeping track of the time and the steps that you do effectively awarding you points and pushing you to do better as time goes on. That's what gamification is. Something that uses elements of games, in this case, tracking points to uh, help you, to motivate you to do something. So that's one pretty scientific way of looking at things that looks at kind of points to help motivate you. It's a gamification system. Now, adding a layer of points and providing competition is just one aspect of gamification. Gamification can, as I hope to show today, mean a lot more than just this. And here's another running app that adds a story layer to your running. So if you want to do exercise, but the idea of pounding the pavement bores you, and you're not really motivated by just getting points for the number of steps or the time that you're out there running, then you can add a storyline to your running with this Zombies Run app. So this is complete with a dramatized story and soundtrack and missions for you to complete as you're out there running around. And I have tried that and I must say it is fascinating. I loved it. But then I am a bit of a fan of zombie stories. So it is another way of gamifying running. Now, it's not just running, of course, you can gamify any part of your life. And there are apps to help you do that. This one, for example, is called Epic Win, and it allows you to build your own tasks and level up any part of your life using 
anything that you might do as part of your daily routine. It could be used to motivate yourself to become more productive or simply turn some things you have to do into something more interesting. So Epic Win is an app that uh, allows you to, to build um, a quest and earn points for doing things like the ironing or washing the dishes or cleaning the house, etc. And I've heard of one family at least that uses this effectively to persuade their teenage children to do more around the house. And after years of not wanting to help out, they were suddenly volunteering to clean and to uh, do all sorts of things that they would never have uh, wanted to do beforehand. So make it into a game and it can help people do things that are dull. That's the idea. Now you can also gamify your sleep. So this is perhaps one of the most bizarre things. This Sleep as Android app allows you to monitor your sleep. And there are other apps uh, um, that are similar as well. You can measure how well you spend the night. It will reward you for going to bed early and for sleeping your eight hours, if that's something that you have difficulty with. You can also record yourself. So you can track when and how strong you snore or listen to what you say during the night if you talk in your sleep. And this is something that appeared around about nine years ago, and it's still going strong. So it's an example of how these, these kinds of gamification apps do work and they are popular with people. Right, now, what is gamification? Sorry, that is gamification, but what about education and what about English language teaching and learning? So let's look at what Jay Reinhardt has written about what happens when someone plays a good digital game first. I'm going to read this aloud. So either close your eyes and listen to me, or put your fingers in your ears while uh, you read, or follow along with me. The choice is yours. So when you're playing a good digital game, a computer, um, computer video or mobile game, a lot is going on. You're learning to play by playing, practicing and perfecting skills, acquiring bits of knowledge, setting goals and achieving them. You're deeply engaged, which means your attention is focused on playing at the cognitive, emotional and perhaps social level. As you achieve your goals, you're highly motivated to keep learning whatever it is you have to. New game rules, stories, language to keep playing. So there we have it. Now, Reinhardt continues this uh, introduction to his book by saying, many second and foreign language educators are envious that an activity like digital gaming seems to have such power to engage and teach and rightly ask themselves whether they might harness some of that capacity for teaching language. Many students these days play digital games. Some are truly avid gamers, and if we could just transfer a bit of that gaming enthusiasm, engagement and motivation to language learning, we just know it would be easier and more effective, but how? So I'm gonna hopefully give you some ideas of how you can try and capture that kind of engagement that you find uh, gamers have when they're playing digital games. But first, let's briefly discuss Terminology. So if you look on the right, I've put some terminology when it comes to gamification. Now gamification, what is it? It's the application of game design elements and game mechanics to non-game situations, such as the classroom, in order to motivate. It was first used in 2008 as a term, and gamification has risen to prominence uh, ever since. It's also attracted a lot of criticism from some game designers, players, and educators, which I'll um, also look at today. Now, gamification is different from other terms used in education when games are used. So you have GBL, which stands for game-based learning, which is the use of games um, when it comes to education, games in general. And serious games is a term used when a game has been specifically designed for teaching or learning something. Alternative names for gamification have been put forward by people who don't like the term. And 
these are sometimes used gainful design gain thinking this term gain thinking for example is sometimes used to contrast with the term gamification to refer to when there's a focus on applying more deeper game elements to learning than the usual ones of points badges and leaderboards leaderboards that are often adopted by proponents of gamification and i'll talk more about that uh, very shortly in general however gamification is the term that is stuck and that's the one i'll be using another good another term that's being used is game informed l2tl which is second language teaching and learning this is effectively gamification but refers to when gamification is specifically applied to the learning and teaching of second languages so when educators combine their knowledge of SLA and L2 pedagogical practice with insights and understanding from theories of games and play. So I'll continue to use the term gamification, I think, for, uh, for simplified purposes, really. And um, we'll also talk about, I'll also talk about the deeper elements of games and using uh, those rather than just points, budgets and leaderboards. But first of all, let's look at points, badges, and leaderboards. So critics of the use of gamification, they often complain that it's all about stripping the superficial aspects of games, the points, badges, and leaderboards that you find, and adding them to classroom activities. And they argue that this promotes a very behaviorist way of learning. Now, of course, points, badges, and leaderboards have a place in game design, and they also have a place, I think, in education, in language education. And I will be looking at some ideas of how you can actually uh, use them uh, in, a, in a little while. But the danger, of course, is that these shallow game mechanics um, are not effective if you just strip them out and put them onto your classroom activities or in, you know, trying to look at using them for behavior in your classroom then you have to be very careful because just applying a point, points, badges and leaderboards, it won't make your classroom immediately fun and engaging. So it depends very much on how you use them, which ones you use and when and why. And it's also important that if you just use this pointification type um, aspect of gamification, then it takes the fun out of it and really fun that's what games are all about and the reason why they work so well um, and i will be looking at fun very shortly but first of all let's look at the terms games and play so what's the difference between games and play now bruno bettelheim an american child psychologist provided these definitions so games are externally have externally imposed rules and they have specific goals that's important uh, in a game and play gives you the freedom from all but personally imposed rules and there is usually no goals so those are the differences between those two terms what about fun another game designer ralph costa has stated that like it or not we live in a world of systems and it's partly up to us whether we want to treat a game system, a given system as a game or not. So if we do that, we can make interacting with that system more fun and we can end up getting more out of it because of it. Now, fun is a very tricky concept, uh, but it is a very important one when it comes to learning, as I'm sure any teacher, particularly teachers of young learners and teenagers will know. So fortunately, Costa has written a very good book, which I recommend, called A Theory of Fun for Game Design. And you don't have to be a game designer to get a lot out of it. I think every educator reading this book would, um, would get a lot out of it. So I recommend that. Let's have a brief look at it. Now, with so much having been written and more attention being paid to games than ever before, Costa has argued that never before have we known so much about games about play and about fun. But his argument is it's the concept of fun that is the most difficult to pin down. What is fun? Well, another game designer, Chris Crawford, has stated that fun is the emotional response to learning. And 
he meant that much of the interest in video games is to do with players learning how the play how the games work and learning how best to live in the game worlds and move forward according to the rules there's a lot of learning in games and this is why it's important for it can be important we can learn a lot as educators from analyzing them looking at how they work and adapting some of adopting some of the practices to our own classrooms so again costa fun and games arises out of mastery it arises out of comprehension comprehension it's the act of solving puzzles that makes games fun with games learning is the drug so this is it why do players want to play games well it's all about actually learning and accomplishing tasks solving puzzles understanding how something works this is what makes games fun Raf believes that game systems as i said before and fun is a neurochemical reward to encourage us to keep trying and one of the things that anyone who's played games will understand or even watch people play games is that people play games and when they fail they try again and they try again and they try again and this is something that would be very useful to be able to get our learners to do it's quite difficult to get learners to do something again and again and again to do it better but games can do that so how do we harness that power well that's the magic bullet i think or the holy grail but let's look at uh, look at how you may want to try and go about it. So another games designer, Nicole Lattero, has gone a step further and she has identified four different types of fun. And she believes when it comes to game design, it's important to have a balance when designing any activity that involves games. And this, I think, is very important for us to keep uh, in mind if we're introducing games or gamification into the classroom as well. So it, you can't just design an activity that will only focus on one type of fun because you may well be excluding people or you may be missing out on lots of opportunities. And the four types of fun are people fun. So the idea of people playing a game and socializing is very important. Anyone who's played a board game will understand that hard fun so we need to make uh, we need to include a challenge and again i think this is this is useful for the language teachers that we know that for our learners to be engaged we need to make our activities challenging they can't be too easy or our students will just get bored and there's easy fun and easy fun comes from if you produce something that is a, a unique way of doing something or a novel way of doing something something that's surprising out of the routine and again this is something we can adopt to our classrooms and most of us i think do and then serious fun serious fun comes from the actual meaning uh, the benefit that learners get when they actually learn something that is about the meaning for example of language etc and they they truly understand something and can use it then that is actually a way of um, of of giving students fun as well Right, so back to gamification and back to the classroom. Why use gamification in the classroom? Well, it can encourage good behaviours with instant positive feedback. So the, um, the points, leaderboards and badges aspect of things can be used. And uh, so long as you keep in mind that it could be overused or it can be used superficially and not very effectively, then I think you can look at how you can adapt it to the uh, to, the, to use in the classroom. And then also gamification can make dull or very dry activities fun, adding story elements uh, in, uh, in a way uh, to your classroom activities can be very beneficial. Right, it can be argued that teachers all over the world are already gamifying behavior. If you're a teacher of children, then it's unlikely that you don't have some kind of set class rules for behavior or use some kind of reward and punishment system to help you manage the class. I know um, you can argue that this isn't something you should do as a young teacher of young learners, but um, it depends a lot, I say, I, I would think on the class. Now reward charts are an excellent tool that can help you build 
consistency in establishing good behaviors in the classroom. They can help encourage positive behavior in kids, teach children to set goals, teach responsibility, track progress for the child. That is very visual. And you can also use it when talking to parents. And as a teacher, you have a good argument if you have this kind of uh, record in your classroom. And getting the best from your students often means, means also tapping into a need that children have in particular for recognition and praise. And this is an easy way of doing it. Of course, some potential problems with the reward charts include kids seeing the rewards as the goal, not the behavior or the learning, and some kids giving up if they fall behind the others. And um, you have to be careful that it isn't always the best kids that always win. Right, there are lots of ways to teach, that teachers promote good behavior and negotiation of rules is just one. But although behavior management is not an issue in some educational contexts, i.e. with motivated adult students who want to learn, it is of course vital in others, especially with uh, rebellious young learners and teenagers who don't want to be in the classroom. So behavior management then I think is fundamental in many educational contexts. One book I highly recommend is this one by Tom Bennett. In it, Tom focuses on bad behavior of all different types and provides advice on how to deal with it. He's a strong believer in sanctions, the stick, if you like, over rewards, i.e. the carrot, because it's perhaps easier for teachers to think of rewards and more difficult for them to impose sanctions. Controversial perhaps, but I think there is a lot of very good suggestions that you can adopt if you are teaching in a situation and having difficulty with classroom management and behavior. What about gamification of behavior management? Well, if you're teaching very young learners up to probably preteens, then one very popular online digital star chart that works uh, very well for gamifying behavior, and again, has been around for about 10 years and is used uh, a lot, is Class Dojo. It allows you to add your students and award points, positive or negative, for whatever you decide to do. If you have a projector in the classroom, or I think they're still around, interactive whiteboards, or some way of um, being able to display your screen, a screen, and show students, then this is something that you can just have on in the background and very quickly use without it interrupting the flow of your lesson. Um, keeping records of the students. It's actually easier to use than actually writing on a paper flow chart that is uh, a star chart that is on the wall, for example. The records of the students can be kept as well, and you can analyze and uh, look at the data in different ways. So again, when you're talking to parents during meetings about children, it can be a very effective tool to use, and it looks like um, you're recording uh, the what happens in the classroom with each of the ch child very individually, etc. So class dojo is aimed at young kids. There are still there are other systems such as class craft, which can be used with slightly older children. I think you know, once you get to 12, 13, 14 year olds, this might be something that would be interesting to use. I don't think you'd want to use it with um, uh, older teens or adults at all. But again, class craft basically does the same thing but it gives each of the students a kind of character and can turn uh, what you do in the classroom into missions etc and it can help gamify learning um, the other way of doing it is um, is something I tried so I tried to manage with a group of 12 year olds to manage the amount of English that one particular class spoke. And I had a hard time encouraging them to speak only English in the class. And it was a Spanish speaking environment in Barcelona and their use of Spanish was becoming very disruptive. So rather than think of sanctions for those who spoke Spanish, I introduced a money system into the classroom and rewarded the students for the use of English, as well as some other things such as arriving to class on time, et cetera, which some of the children have difficulty doing. Now, during the class, I would reward them for certain activities and take money off any student who spoke Spanish. So I started giving this money to the students 
for work done, homework, etc. And also, when some students uh, told me that their classmates were speaking Spanish, I would take the child, take the money off one child and give it to the other. Um, again, you might think this is a little controversial, but I was surprised how well it worked. It was a very fun way of doing it. It wasn't taken very seriously. It became something that um, didn't interrupt, interrupt the flow of the class to award points, not even, it was quicker to do than even class dojo or star chart. And it would just, I would just pull out uh, these Graham banknotes, Graham euros from my back pocket and give them to the, to the students. And another reason why this worked was every month I had auctions and the students could use the money that they had to bid on things which I sold in class. And these were just generally free gifts or other items that typically the school would have pencils, badges, rubbers, bags, stickers, or that I got from conferences or other stuff really. And I auctioned these off to the highest bidder and that was something that a lot of the children uh, really enjoyed. And this would take place in the last five minutes of class at the end of the month, so it wouldn't take up much time either. Right. Now, one thing I noticed during the auctions and using the system was the difference between the students. Some would hoard their virtual money and never spend it. They preferred to have it saved and would count it often uh, at the beginning of class or at the end of class, keeping it safe in their folders. Others would use it, would spend it as soon as they could, and then others would save up and spend it on specific items they knew would be auctioned. So if you as you gamify your class, you know students adopt different roles and are, dis different, are interested in different elements of play. And just like the four types of fun that uh, Nicole Latterell um, identified, there is another way of looking at gamers that you can adapt to how you approach gamification in the classroom. And this is Richard Bartle's player types. And on the left-hand side, you can try out using that link, the way of classification for yourself. But whenever you create a game or gamify an activity for class, you need to take into mind what type of game players your children are and make sure that you're catering for all of them. Or you could even, with all older students, you could actually find out by asking them to take the, uh, the actual test. And there are a number of different links to different tests. Uh, based on Bartle's player types that you can find on the internet. Now, it may well be pseudoscience science here, but it does give you an insight into what kind of games your students like, which can help when if you're using gamification. There are four types, as you, I hope you can see on the screen. There are killers. There, that's a term for players who just like to compete with others. There are achievers. And these are people who play to gain success and prestige. Socializers, who the main reason for playing are for the social aspect, for the friendship, rather than the game itself. And explorers, and those are the players who like to look for new things and document that. Now, normally players are not one or the other, they're a combination of different types. And you could probably guess what type of player you are. If not, you can do the test to find out. Right, I also recommend learning from games. I'm not going to look at this in great detail, but if you play a game like this particular popular app game called Clash of Clans, then you can see how these games are popular and have been very successful because they, they appeal to different types of players. So in other words, you have the building and the exploring aspect, the world building, the construction in this game, but you also have defense of the village. You can actually attack and defend. Uh, you decide how much or how little you want to do. You can actually just collect resources um, if you want as well. And so that aspect of, of, of the type of players is there. You also have points. So you have the number of trophies that uh, players have earned the stars you get for um, when you attack a particular village. 
you have experience points, you have levels. So you can see I'm level 67 here. And you can see my experience points. Um, you can see the trophies I have. You also see the treasure and resources that I've earned there. And then you have things called achievements. Now this is another layer which I'm going to talk about how you can add to your classroom, but it's very important because it, it also means that you can give players who are particularly, maybe they don't appear on the leaderboards, but you can reward them in other ways. I'll talk about this in a minute. And again, here's the leaderboard, which uh, you can find in most types of games like this. Right. And then, of course, the social aspect. So there was a, there's a chat and there's a community uh, aspect to it. Now, how can you adopt this to the classroom? Well, if you want to go serious, then I recommend this book by Lee Sheldon, The Multiplayer Classroom. He talks in great detail his experiments of converting his classroom into an adventure game and how he basically turned all of the content into quests and adventures. Um, it's fascinating. You would have to be very seriously into gamification to do it. But I do recommend if this is a subject that appeals, then this is the book to find out how you can do it um, and what works and what doesn't work. Um, really recommend it. Now, using Sheldon's book as a model, I talked about achievements, for example. And I gamified part of my, I've gamified parts of my classes in the past. And a simple way of encouraging things like attendance and homework completion is to develop a system of achievements. Now, these are points or badges that can be awarded, or if you use a money system, you can actually give money out um, in class for this. And they can add an extra and simple level of fun to the classroom. I think you might not be able to read this particular, but for example, these are unlocked achievements. So when, for example, everybody in the class attends, then um, everyone in the class goes up a level or gets certain points. So that encourages peer pressure for everybody to actually come along to, to, to class. The same could be everyone, when all of the students actually arrive on time to class, this could be another achievement unlocked. And that will encourage the other students to persuade or to encourage their, uh, their colleagues, their classmates to come along on time to class as well. Total attendance after one month without anyone missing a class, you can also give achievements to points or badges or et cetera, or you can give an achievement to all of the individual students that don't miss a single class during a month. If all of the class do homework, the same thing, individual students, homework, and um, if all of the students answer the, you know, if the student answers all of the questions correctly in a particular exercise or homework uh, for homework, then you can give badges and awards, et cetera, as well. And there are so many different things you can do. And this helps make, um, make everyone in the class feel that they're being rewarded for the good behavior and the good work that they're doing. Um, not, so there's not just one linear way of, of, of being rewarded. I think that is something that you need to take into account carefully if you're going to gamify any aspect of your class, particularly this type of aspects. Right, so I decided to focus on, um, on I decided what I wanted to gamify after surveying uh, my class of 12 year olds. So I found that they self-identified as having problems with writing long text in English. They found it boring and difficult. So this is what um, I gave a little survey and this is what came out as being the most difficult thing that they, they had. So I then decided to adopt speed reading, which would encourage them to write for long, long texts and it would only take up five minutes of their time in class. I did that, I awarded points. I um, gave them points for the number of, each, one point for each word that they wrote during the speed reading exercise. And I asked them then to self-correct. And I corrected them uh, as well and subtracted a point for each error that they made. So what happened was I kept a leaderboard of the number of, this is the number of words on the number of days 
that uh, we did the speed reading in class. And so we had levels uh, there. And as you can see, it was successful in that it did encourage some students, you could see at the top of the leaderboard in particular, to write more and write more accurately. However, what I did notice, which is something you have to be very careful with gamification, is that with some other students, we had difficulty. And you can see that some of the numbers of words that the students wrote dropped in the middle of this exercise. They got a little bit demotivated by it because they thought that they weren't going to be on the leaderboards and why then, uh, why then continue doing it. So this is where you come in with your achievements. So I gave special achievement awards to the most original writing rather than, you know, it was all about trying to get them to write more and to write more accurately, but I did want to um, reward them for originality. Fewer mistakes. There are some, some, reg, some students who wrote, they didn't write lots, but they wrote without many mistakes at all, which is a nice skill to have. And I did want to um, reward that and rec uh, appreciate it. There were some students who were uh, creative, some had good endings and encouragements, uh, introductions, etc. And this is a way of identifying, identifying that. Now, um, I've got quite a lot more. I realise I've got quite a lot more, uh, but I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Paul, I should kind of stop around on the hour. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, more or less. I mean, you can go over. It's fine. Doesn't doesn't matter if you've okay. got a bit. Yeah. All right. Okay. You just interrupt me when you want me to shut up then. Um, <laughs> okay. So I wrote, if you're interested in the details of that study that I did in my classroom, then I wrote a chapter about it, which is available and published in that, this book here. Now, what else can you gamify? I gamified writing in that particular way, very individualized for um, my class. And it took me quite a long time to put that system. If you want something a bit more quick, then you can gamify writing with preteens, with this website, Story Starters. You select a genre and you spin the wheels and the, the software will give you a setting, characters and scenarios for writing and fiction. And if the class don't like a particular element, you can spin each individual wheel to change it until you write to negotiate with, with the class a subject for their writing homework, for example. It's a fun way of doing that. Or you could even just get the students to go to the website and choose their own writing homework based on this. Another way of gamifying writing in the classroom is to use the fabulous Rory's Story Cubes that you can buy from any game shop. And that's a fun way of encouraging students to write or to speak um, to make up stories. And if you only have one set, you can still use them in class and you can get one volunteer student from each table to take a photo of the dice before you move them to another table, for example. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about gamifying speaking. Now, I have used screenshots from a game and this demand high ELT methodology, which was started by, uh, which is, was devised by Adrian Underhill and Jim Scrivener to gamify speaking. Now, demand high asks, are our learners capable of much more than we ask them to do? And how can you push your students to upgrade their language and improve their skills more than they believe are possible? And I realized when I was exploring this that I could use screenshots from this popular computer game, Droppy, to push students to speak at a very higher level than what they were doing. How did I do it? Well, I took the screenshots and because it's a puzzle game, there's an initial state of the game and then a finished state of the game with the uh, solutions on. And I use those five, uh, five game screens, five screenshots to show the initial scheme. And of course, here, for example, you have the problem is that the man and the horse is hot, the horse is thirsty, the man's thirsty. What what can what could you do basically? What can you do? Depending on the language you want out of it, you you, you can change the question. So you can explain 
uh, then you show the second screen. The second screen, um, there's the first screen, for example, in more detail, then there's the second screen. So you can then say what has happened. So you can try and hypothesize between one screen and the other, the students try and talk. And they usually come out with language that is okay. And then you, if you, again, if you're using a point system or a money system, you can give points of money to the students for doing that. And then you ask another student, okay, can you build upon that and say it more, can you say it more sophisticated? Can you say more about what has happened? And this way you build up to a point where all of the students try as best as they can to, um, to express what they have to say. And you're really pushing them to speak at their highest level. This works with any kind of level of, of class because you reach a point where they can't say anything um, using more vocabulary or more accurately or longer than they can. So it's a very useful activity. You can also gamify classwork or project work. You can gamify all of the work that you do in class. And this is particularly interesting if you have a dull or dry course book, or you just want to spice things up um, from time to time and add a different dynamic to your lessons. This works well with preteens and teenagers, but you can use it with older students as well. And how do you approach it? Well, you divide the class into groups. You ask them to design an island. And you tell them this is a country and ask them to decide on a system of government, democracy, dictatorship, monarchy, et cetera. They decide on the roles. Somebody might be the president or the king or queen, etc. And then others could be the minister of trade, the prime minister, the tourism minister, etc. And then you also decide on the natural resources, mountains, lakes, etc. geography that they have. Once you have that done, you can put the islands together in a cluster and you can see that I've done that above. And then you could just go back to it and use it from time to time, depending on what you're doing. So that's how I did it. I got the students to design a paper and then I traced over it in a paint program to make it more flexible and easier uh, to use and then put them all together in a screenshot, which we use called the Lingua Islands. Now, one of the first activities I asked the learners to do with this island project was to write descriptions of the islands. Uh, and some of the places on the islands. And this became part of what was a growing tourist guide to the islands. And then of course, you can have them do little commercials, adverts about their island. You could have a trade mission. You could have a conference where each of the students are presenting their particular islands to the other uh, islanders and et cetera, et cetera. There's all sorts of things you can do based on what you want to, um, want to achieve. So that's been a whistle stop tour of some of the things that I found interesting about gamification and how you might want to use gamification in your own class. To, sum up, to, to summar, summarize, I think gamification can really help to encourage students to do something they don't want to do or they find a little bit demotivating. So it can motivate um, and add an extra layers of interest to whatever you do in the classroom. And you can also find that you can start something and they might think they don't want to do something, but actually they actually, once they start doing the activity, the speaking, the reading, et cetera, writing long text, they actually find they enjoy it and they were wrong about that. So hopefully this has been of interest to you all. I think we will have some questions, I hope. So thank you very much. Are there any questions, Paul? There are. Thank you, Graham. <laughs> Thanks very much, Graham. That's really interesting. Lots and lots of fantastic ideas um, and lots of stuff going on there. Um, yeah, really interesting. Thank you. And lots of comments as well from people in the chat. And lots of useful ideas, I think, from uh, from the look of what people have been saying. So thank you. Uh, questions. There are some questions. Yes. Uh, da, 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 da. Ah, OK, I can see you're typing in that. That one, the link to the book. That's good. Um, let's have a look. Okay, and I, uh, I thought this might be quite a good one for you because I know how you feel about the word addiction when it comes to games. Um, can gamifying instruction increase student addiction to games and e-play? <laughs> yes. So I think that's 
A very interesting question. I think it's the responsibility of parents in particular to limit the kind of digital play, if you like, um, or games that their, their, their children play. Um, how, how is that, are teachers responsible for? Well, I think you need to be careful um, with it. You need to see what the students are like, you know, find out how much they play already. I don't believe that gaming is an addiction, to be honest. I do think that it is an activity that can be overindulged, like any hobby or activity or any kind of screen time in the same way that, you know, would we think that television is an addiction? Um, most adults or a lot of adults spend many, many hours every evening watching TV. Do we consider that as an addiction? Well, when I was growing up, it was considered as an addiction, but I don't think we do that now. I think if anything, playing games is a more useful, more brain stimulating uh, activity than sitting passively in front of a TV. So I would argue that it's a much healthier thing for children to be doing than just sitting and mm -hmm. watching possibly. So I don't know. Great. Thanks, Graham. Um, okay. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, okay, academic purposes. Can gamification be used? This is from Fuang um, Nguyen. Uh, can gamification be used for academic purposes and for adult learners? I feel my classroom academic writing is quite boring, but I don't know if using this method in the class will be risky. Uh, my students are working adults, so I don't know if it's suitable for them. Um, have you had sort of experiences with classes where they haven't kind of responded? Or is, is it something that yeah. you found? Yeah. Yeah, I don't think gamification or games are suitable for all, all students. Okay. Even, you know, you. I've, I've had classes of preteens in the past that I've decided that playing games is actually not a good thing or gamifying is not a good thing. I think you need to know your students. That's the key. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. in your, I think any teacher at the beginning of the year or the beginning of, of their time with them, you should start to get to know your students. You can do that very quickly. If you have big classes with surveys, you can get them to fill in. One of the things you can ask is about games. You, I think every teacher um, should be asking your, asking their students about the games that they play now anyway, because game playing, gaming is such an important part of many students' lives, adults included now, that it's an area that if you don't ask about it, you're excluding that from a potentially rich source of conversation, of all sorts of things that you can do in the classroom. So once you find out the what your students are like, do they play games? How often do they play games? What kind of games do they play as part of, you know, you would ask your students the books they read, the TV series they watch, the hobbies they have, well, why not include games? It's often excluded from the kind of area of interest that teachers um, focus upon when they're finding out about their students, but I don't think it should. Mm -hmm. you, you may well, you may well be a teacher who doesn't play games. Mm. Um, if you are, I don't think you should ex even exclude the question as well, because you can use it to find out more about them. You can use that lack of knowledge about game playing and games with the students and ask them to tell you about it, to talk about it. And, you know, they're not display questions, they're real questions that you'll have about uh, without knowing, etc. So I think you do that first. Then you can decide whether it's appropriate to add elements of gamification or games into your classes, but only when you kind of know. And if they're adults, if they're adult learners, as I think this question applied to what they were, then you can ask them, but do you think, can, should we try and make this a bit more fun? Should we add elements of games to it and see how they respond? Mm -hmm. Okay.
Great. Thank you. Hopefully that answers the question. Um, okay. A uh, question from Azra. Um, I can't pronounce that surname. Sorry, Tahizi. Uh, what is the difference between gamification and game-based learning? Hmm. So game-based learning is when you um, take a game, whether it's been specifically made for education, for language learning or teaching, and use it with your learners, either for homework or in class. So you're actually using the game as it is. Gamification is when you take an element of that you find in games, like points, badges, leaderboards, the kind of story of a game or um, any other gameplay mechanics, and add it to something that isn't a game. So you might want to gamify your textbook by taking something, an activity in the textbook, and turning it into a role playing game. That's what something that students uh, that teachers do uh, a lot is um, adapt classbook activities. Well, if you're adding an element that you would find, if you're turning an exercise in a book into a game, um, you might take an end of unit quiz and actually put it on the, ask the questions and put it on the board like a uh, play tic-tac-toe or, or blockbusters or any other kind of game uh, system. That would be gamifying your textbook. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's the difference. Okay. Um, okay. This was sort of more from a, a comment in the chat, but around, I mean, I suppose it's a question around inclusion. Um, do, have you found, or do you find that in where maybe you have students who've got special educational needs or disabilities that the, the the gamification or the aspect of gamification or some of the ideas that you suggested would need to be adapted or changed or not used or I don't know maybe you haven't had experience of that but I just I'm just sort of throwing it out there as a as a question yeah I think with with students with special educational needs disabilities mm. I think you need to think carefully about anything you do in the class so the way you mm. approach teaching and learning to make sure that they're not disadvantaged. So the same is true. It doesn't have any particularly special um, way of uh, approaching it, but I think you do need to make sure that whatever you do in the classroom, be it gamification or any kind of activity, mm -hmm. um, is inclusive for all yeah. learners. There are ways in which you could probably um, use gamification to appeal to special education needs learners. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think you have to look at specific examples, but it would depend on what needs that the that mm -hmm. they have. But definitely, I think it's something that you need to have at the forefront of your mind when you're teaching. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, just a quick question here from Suzette. Oliveira, uh, you mentioned Yu Yukai Chu. Um, do you know? Have you got anything on the gamification octalysis? Do you know about that? That's that's the that's where that quote comes from. So he yeah. has a very interesting book. It's not about language teaching or education and gamification. It is a general book about in gamification, but he's one of the kind of more interesting proponents and his book called Actionable Gamification mm. um, by Yu Kai Chu is a very interesting read. And it's clear that for many years he's um, gone into uh, gamification and our elements of gamification, the eight, there, are eight, there are actually nine Although it indicates that from the um, from the name of it, there are eight um, eight aspects. There are actually nine aspects, and yeah, there's a hidden okay. aspect called the physical sensation aspect. But if you look them up on the internet, you will find a website that um, actually uh, has lots of information on it as well, and you can 
go to that website and get a flavor of, of his book. So without reading his book, you can get a look at it. I do think that a lot of what he says in his book is not relevant for language teaching or learning. Mm -hmm. okay. So I don't want to recommend that everybody go out, all teachers go out and buy that book because I think the way I've been looking at it is that it's all very thought provoking, but a lot of what he actually puts in his book is about gamification for work. Um, okay. 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 Thank you. There's also a book I think that you recommended to me a long, a long while, while ago called Reality is Broken. Um, yes, Jane McGonigal. Jane McGonigal, which is also a very good book. Yeah, um, there are lots of um, really good books about it. In fact, um, I don't know, Paul, if you're going to make my slides. If, if we can, if, if we can, yes. Um, I can share those with you. Yeah. The reason why is because I'm still sharing my screen, aren't I? I have actually a bibliography. Okay, great. There we go. There about yeah. a number of different areas. So, and the links to a lot of the things that I've talked about are there as well. In, Brilliant. In okay. 